Yes, I am a folklorist and a storyteller, and I've been working in that capacity in business now for well, a few decades. But it didn't always used to be this way. In fact, when I was in graduate school getting my doctorate in folklore, my passion was barns. Uh, you know, barns, you know, square barns and round barns and hay barns and corn barns, German barns and English barns. I loved barns. <laughs> now, what folklorists do is we study how a community or an organization or a group sustains and maintains itself through time and how it transfers its knowledge and its values and its wisdom all through creative expression like art, craft, architecture, stories, song, and music, things like that. And as a graduate student, I certainly had to learn about stories. I had to learn how to collect them and how to document them and how to analyze them and how to preserve them. And frankly, I thought that was all kind of boring. <laughs> so stories, eh. Until one day, a man named Ron Evans showed up in our department. He's a Chippewa Cree from up in Saskatchewan, Canada and he held all of the sacred stories for his tribe. He thought we might be interested in what he had to say, and we were falling all over ourselves, gathering chairs together to sit down and listen to him. Well, Ron ended up being, I think, my first storytelling teacher, and he really ignited in me the passion for storytelling. Here's how Ron would tell stories, because I would organize some evenings and weekends for him whenever he came into Philadelphia. And he would tell stories from like Friday evening all the way till 6 p.m. on Sunday evening. So we'd be gathered around, and Ron would be in a nice comfy chair, and this is what he would do. And we'd be waiting and waiting. Oh, he'd say, that's the story that wants to be told. So then he would tell the story and he'd tell a little bit about the story. And then when that was done, he'd recline back in his chair. And we'd be waiting until he said again, oh, that's the story that wants to be told. Well, that was one of my first lessons in storytelling from Ron, which was the power of deep listening. Listening for the story that wanted to be told at that particular time with that particular audience. And Ron had and has, I shouldn't say it's in the past tense, he's still around uh, us uh, today. Uh, he holds, holds you know, probably about mm, a thousand sacred stories in him. I also observed that even though Ron was done telling stories by Sunday evening, those of us sitting around him, we could have sat there for another two weeks straight and not yet been fully fed. From that, I learned how hungry we are for these kinds of stories, stories that really nurture our souls. And so I learned also from Ron, the difference between junk food stories and stories that really sustain us and feed us well. Now, I love TV and my reality shows, but that is like having soda pop and potato chips. Sort of stops the temporary hunger, but you can't really be healthy and live well on that kind of a diet. And same with stories. We need stories that touch our souls, that feed us, and that sustain us. I also learned from Ron that stories have work to do in the world. And you know, we all tell stories. We all have amazing stories to tell. 
and stories have work to do in the world. But for Ron, you know, these stories that lived in him, he considered them living, breathing beings that were then given life in the telling and then could go out into the world and do their work. For about 15 years, I've always talked about storytelling being the creation of art in the air. And just like any art, it has work to do. And so that requires us a little bit when we think about it, uh, storytelling in that way, and our stories. It's like, oh, yes, maybe, you know, stories aren't so trivial. Maybe our stories do have import, and you know they do. Because no one of us can know the totality of the great mystery of life, but by golly, we sure do learn little bits in, of wisdom as we go along and live our lives. And when I share a story with you, you share a story with me, we share back and forth these little nuggets of wisdom. And as a result, our experience of life grows. And the sum of the, how do they say that? The sum of the, the parts is greater than the sum. You know what I mean. Well, I eventually moved away from academics and into business, and oh, that's a whole other story that is for another time. Uh, but I still remained a folklorist and a storyteller, working in business and organizational development and organizational change and leadership, but not that I could ever call it that could never really say I was a folklorist or a storyteller because I wanted to work. So I did all of my work undercover. And one of the things that I loved to do, one of the things I loved to do was collect all the stories in an organization, as many as I could, and assess the health of the organization based on the stories that were being told. So part of the assessment process. It wasn't until about the year 2000 when a few colleagues of mine published books about the importance and power of storytelling in business. And all of a sudden, when I'm meeting with my executives, they're saying, hey, I read this book on storytelling, and you know, that was really great. And I think we need to pay attention to our stories, and I think we need to learn how to tell our stories better. Well, I thought, hallelujah. It took me about a year and I finally came out of the closet, admitted I was a folklorist, admitted I was a storyteller, and finally had weight and meaning and import for people, and uh, it was pretty cool. So uh, ever since about the year 2000, that's what I've been doing, I've been working with stories to bring them into being a core competence for organizations and a core leadership competence. Now today, I don't want to talk to you about the power or the need or um, the importance of storytelling. There have been so many fabulous TED speakers who have talked on these topics uh, before me and have laid a fabulous foundation. But what I do want to talk to you about today is a simple story process that any one of you can do that will really help you make a difference in the world. Now, how does making a difference really happen? Really, really? Well, it happens when, first of all, you have a connection with somebody. Now, just not any kind of a connection. A connection that is meaningful and deep. Where trust is present. Where authenticity occurs and where other people feel empowered in your presence. And that's what this story process that I'm going to share with you can do. It has three steps to it. The first step is to just listen delightedly when somebody is sharing a story with you. The second step is to ask a few questions, but a certain kind of question, a few reflective questions. And then the third step 
is to offer appreciations back to the teller for what you heard and the story that was told. Well, let's go talk a little bit about each one of these steps in more depth. The first one, listen delightedly. This is where you just get to sit back or just totally enjoy the story that someone is telling you. But this is how we normally listen when somebody is telling a story. We think about, oh, the um, piece of advice that we're going to give or the comment that we're going to make or maybe the story we're going to share in return. In other words, it's all a one-way conversation that's happening inside our own heads. And we're not really listening. So in listening delightedly, you just put all of that aside. Uh, you don't interrupt the person, and you just listen delightedly. Now, why in heaven's name would you want to do that? Well, first of all, because you want to listen the best story possible out of someone. The best story possible. You want to be in total service to them. The second step is asking a few questions. Now, questions kind of fall into two camps. There's information questions and there are reflective questions. Usually what comes to mind first are information questions. Things like, oh, what year did that happen? Or um, what was that person's name? Or what city were you in? when you had that experience. But you know, those information questions, they satisfy our own curiosity. But do they really help the storyteller understand a little bit more about the story? Do they help you understand a little bit more about the story? Not really. So we put those information questions aside and ask them later. And what we want to do instead is ask a few reflective questions like, well, what did that story mean to you? Or what um, did you learn from that experience? Or how has that experience colored your life as you've gone along? Questions that get at a deeper meaning and create a deeper connection. And then the third step. The third step is just offering appreciations back to the storyteller for all the great things that you heard in their story all the things that you liked about the story, all the things about the story and the way it affected you. When I work with this process, with my senior executives, you know, sometimes they have uh, known each other, worked with each other for 10 years. And after the process, they go, I never knew that about you. And what they're really saying is, gosh, I know you a little bit better now. Oh, I have a deeper connection with you. And oh, I trust you a little bit better. And oh, by the way, isn't that how good work really gets done? When I'm at conferences and people who have never met before sit next to each other and go through this process, sometimes they come up to me afterwards and they say, oh, Karen. I want to introduce you to my new best friend, or the sister I never had, or the brother I wish I'd had. And sometimes these connections last beyond the conference. And then sometimes when I do this in workshops, someone will come up to me and say, you know, I, uh, I don't think I've ever really been listened to in my entire life. And at that point, I don't know whether to just, you know, kind of gently smile or to cry. But that's the opportunity that's in front of you. The opportunity to listen in these particular ways, to respond in these particular ways as someone is sharing a story with you to create a deeper connection, to experience a depth of meaning. 
to really experience someone's magnificence because, you know, we are all magnificent. We all have amazing stories to share. And when you listen this way to somebody's story, you may be inspired. And the more you listen for stories in this way, you end up living an inspired life because these stories are just amazing, even the littlest ones. Now, that's a new narrative. And that's the power of story listening and its ability to make a difference in the world, either personally or professionally, or when you're trying to bring a vision into the world to make it a better place. And it's a simple story process that any one of us can do. And I look forward to hearing your stories today.